Getting ahead of the game. This is Keith. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I apologise to the recording, anybody watching. He's just this guy, you know. Introduce yourself. Okay, righto. <laughs> well, hello. For the benefit of removing confusion, I'm Russell Keith McGee. Um, most of you have probably heard my name before. Uh, I'm an 11-year veteran of the Django core team. I was president of the Django Software Foundation from 2011 to 2015. And as an interesting little tidbit, uh, along with Andrew Godwin, uh, I jointly hold the title of most Django cons attended. Uh, this Django con AU for both of us is our 21st Django con. This particular talk is actually an update of a talk that I gave four years ago at DjangoCon US 2013 in Chicago. Uh, at that time, I was talking about a long-awaited feature that had just been added to Django. It was, uh, called, it was Ticket 3011, uh, adding custom user models to Django. That patch that was th on, on Ticket 3011 became part of Django 1.5, and the Django world rejoiced. And so, with apologies to Dr. Seuss, this talk is all about this feature of Django 1.5, why you'd want to use it, how you use it, and some tips for how to avoid problems, and, because this is a redo, uh, what's changed since it was originally introduced. Okay, so why should we care about this feature at all? Well, the primary end user use case that was driving Ticket 3011 was to be able to log into a Django website using your email address. Strangely, this was actually something you had been able to do uh, in Django from pretty much the beginning. It wasn't well documented and it was fiddly to set up, but it could be done. So the driving factor here wasn't so much about doing email-based login at all, it was about doing it easily. Another common request was to be able to associate profile data with the user model. In most cases, this was a common request for the same reason that children request ice cream and cookies for dinner. It's something they want, it's obvious why they want it, but it's not necessarily good for them. But, there's a much more important reason why I was motivated to work on custom user models, and it's one that I'd like to spend a few minutes focusing on, because common web experience demonstrates that it's not clearly understood. The default Django user model embeds a really bad anti-pattern for user identification. First name, last name. Huh? What do you mean, first name, last name is an anti-pattern? Well, yes, it is. Let's start with an easy one. This gentleman, his name is Mao Zedong. His given name is Dong. The middle character, Tse, is a generational name, and his siblings share that same generational name. His brothers were Mao Zemin and Mao Zetan. His sister was Mao Zehong. If you were on familiar terms with this gentleman, you'd normally would have referred to him as Tse Dong, including his generational name, not just Dong, his given name. So what's his first name? The only name you wouldn't call his first name is Mao, which is his first name. Some Chinese people who come to the West adopt Western names so they don't have to hear Westerners like me mutilate their given names. Uh, it's not on any formal documentation, but it is how they identify themselves. This gentleman, former center for the Houston Rockets, his name is Yao Ming, family name of Yao, given name of Ming. He has no generational name, but he signed autographs as Fred Yao Ming, or sometimes Fred Ming Yao, adopting a Western ordering of his Chinese name. Putting assumed names into first name, last name is problematic at best. This lady's name is Björkus Munstertier. Her given name is Björk. She's from Iceland. She doesn't have a family name. Her last name, Gudmundstertier, literally means daughter of Gudmunda. If you were referring to Björk, you would call her Björk. You would call her Björk Gudmundstertier. You wouldn't call her Miss Gudmundstertier. Telephone directories in Iceland are ordered by first name, not last name. And Björk doesn't share a last name with her father. Her father's name was Gudmunda Gunnarsson, literally son of Gunnar. So last name won't help you identify someone's family. This convention is common in Iceland and South India and Malaysia, Indonesia. It's called a patronym. That is a name that describes your paternal lineage, your father, not your family. The former prime minister of Malaysia, Mahathir bin Mohammed, bin means son of. If you were referring to this gentleman formally, you would call him Mr. Mahathir, not Mr. Mohammed or Mr. bin Mohammed, which also adds the complication. Is his last name Mohammed? or bin Muhammad, because if his last name is Muhammad, where does the bin go? Because it isn't his middle name. 
Another common naming convention, second personal names. So this gentleman, former president of Egypt, generally known around the world as Anwar Sharat, he would introduce himself personally as Anwar, but his full name is Muhammad Anwar El Sadat. M-O-H-D, Muhammad, is a common abbreviation in the Arabic world. What's his first name? It's not just first names either. Last names can be complicated too. Spanish-speaking people will commonly have two family names, not hyphenated, two independent names. This lady, Aranzanzu Isabella Maria Sanchez Vicario, commonly referred to as Arancha Sanchez. You would refer to her formally as Senorita Sanchez, and that's why you'll sometimes see her referred to as Arancha Sanchez. She's not Senorita Vicario. In Portuguese, they do it the other way around, usually maternal name, then paternal name. But even then, those wacky Brazilians, uh, they like to mix it up. They can have up to four surnames, and they won't always use the last one as their family name. And then there are people like this gentleman. His name, singular, <laughs> is Stilgarian. He's a technology journalist who changed his name by deed poll when he was in his late 20s. But it isn't just a deed poll troublemaker problem. In many cultures, it is common to have names that consist of a single given name only. With no last name or patronym, they literally have one name. It's called a mononym. This gentleman was the third Secretary General of the United Nations. His name, singular, is Thant. The U isn't his first name, it's not an abbreviation, it's the Burmese equivalent of Mr. How common is this? Well, as of 2011, there were over 13,000 people in Australia with a mononym who were eligible to receive government health benefits. It's safe to assume there are a lot more now. It's an edge case, but it's not an obscure edge case. And this isn't even an exhaustive list. I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of answers you can get to the relatively simple question, what is your name? It's such a big problem, the W3C has a whole rundown of them. Wikipedia has even more detail with hundreds of pages on each different cultural naming style and convention. You can easily get trapped in there for decades just reading the stuff about names. Why do we care as Django developers? Well, the problem is that Django's default user model does almost the very worst thing it can do. It, is, it embeds first name, last name as a naming convention. It assumes that your first name can be used to address you formally and that Mrs. or Mr. last name is appropriate formally. This is, to use the precise technical term, wrong. <laughs> the only thing you could do that would be more wrong is this. <sighs> Which, if you've ever had to submit your name to a US government database, is something you've probably seen. Well, the good news is that Django 1.5 gave us a way out of this particular mud pit. Um, but there isn't a simple answer. You need to pay attention to what it is you're trying to do. The W3C on that web page has suggestions, but it doesn't give you a single, this is the right way, because there isn't a single answer. You need to be very aware of what it is you're trying to achieve with a name. So, do you need separate fields at all? Can you just ask for their full name? And if you do, make sure the database field you put in there is long enough. If Abu Karim Muhammad al-Jamil ibn Nadal ibn Abdulaziz al-Filistini visits your website, <laughs> are you going to be able to fit his full name? And if it does, does that full name actually help you at all? If you do use separate fields, don't use first and last name, use family name and other or given names. Even that's going to fall foul of people with mononyms and uh, Icelandic type families who don't have a family name. Another approach, ask for a full name, but then ask for a second name that covers a specific purpose. For example, maybe you want to refer to Russell's contacts up in the top right-hand corner of your user interface. Or maybe you want to send someone an email on a regular basis with their dear so-and-so at the start of the email. Ask how your user wants to be addressed and put that name in there. But you also have to account for cultural expectations. Not everyone is happy for a stranger to call them by their given name. Some other tips to keep in mind. Don't assume a single letter is an initial. M is shorthand for Muhammad. U is an honorific in Burmese. Be wary of something called name part algorithms, the V card and H card formats uh, used, used for uh, 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 identifiers on, on emails. Uh, both use something called the implied N optimization that has lots of problems with Chinese names. Names don't fit into algorithms. Spaces, apostrophes, and hyphens. <laughs> Are uh, all legal characters in names? Ask me how I know. <laughs> Make sure your fields don't validate out perfectly valid characters. Don't require a family name. If you do try to enforce this, people with just one name, with mononyms, will enter garbage into your database, like full stop or mister, just to get past your form validation. Don't ask for maiden names. 
that's again just cultural sensitivity. Not all married women change their names at marriage. Not all name changes are due to marriage. And sometimes a man will change his name either for marriage or for other reasons. Honorifics are also extremely complex. You can't just add Mr. to the start of a, to, to the, to a last name. And if you get to languages like German, the formal honorific for a male with a PhD working at a university is Herr Professor Dr. Schmidt. Hidden in, <laughs> hidden in this honorific issue is another identity related question that I'd like to take a moment to address. Thankfully, Django doesn't violate this one, um, but it's worth drawing attention to because it is so common. Uh, it's so common that my first hit on a Google search was an example doing it wrong. Um, this example form breaks the name rule because it uses first name, last name, but it also then asks for gender and provides two options. Why? What's the purpose of this question? One of the few and only contexts in which it makes any sense at all to ask this question is for medical reasons, in which case it's both incomplete, at the very least you need to have an other or some other generic category, and it's incorrectly framed. You should be asking about sex, not gender. Gender is an issue of social identity, sex is purely biological. And even just on the purely biological thing, it's not an esoteric issue. It affects at least one in a thousand people, possibly more, and that's purely on the biological basis of sex, not issues of gender identity or transgender or genderqueer or anything like that. I say one in a thousand, in certain demographics it's much higher. In the 1996 Olympics, there were 3,512 female attendees. Eight athletes, eight female athletes, failed the mandated sex test that was standard IOC practice at that time. That's one in 500. That's twice the you know, nominal background rate. And ironically, all eight of them failed in ways that conveyed absolutely no performance benefit. Now, you can get a really good rundown on the medical background of that particular problem in this article. It all came about because of the Proposition, uh, Proposition 8 a California Marriage Amendment, which thankfully has now been resolved in the United States, not here. Um, that article, though, doesn't talk about the questions of the psychology or the sociology of questions of sex and gender. It is a purely medical analysis of the problems inherent in the question, are you male or female? And as the article points out in graphic detail, it is not a simple binary question at all. Why am I banging on about this? Well, user models fundamentally are about identity, and identity is important. Think about yourself and how you feel when someone forgets your name or spells your name wrong, gets your name wrong, uh, calls you a missus if you're a man, calls you mister if you're a woman. It speaks to your personal identity. And being presented a box on a website where you can't put your name in or you can't describe how you perceive your gender identity, this affects how an individual will feel about your website. If my name doesn't fit in your boxes, you're telling me I don't care about you. And I get this regularly and I'm not that abnormal when it comes to naming conventions. If you want to engage users, you need them to feel welcome. And that starts with accurately acknowledging and allowing them to express their identity. And sometimes that means not asking questions at all. Why do you want to know someone's age, their sex or their gender? Do you actually have a reason for asking or are you just asking because you can? You need to think about identity when you're developing sites. And Having thought about it and established what is culturally appropriate and necessary for your application, how does Django help? Well, as of Django 1.5, you can define your own user model that describes exactly whatever you need or want for your particular website. How do you do it? Well, uh, as Lily said before, Django's docs do this pretty well. Um, it is all covered in the docs, but here's the rundown. First stop, you need to describe a user model. It's just a normal Django model that uh, happens to describe whatever properties you want your user to have. Django provides two base classes. There's an abstract base user that gives you a password and a last login, and that's it. The last login is needed for password refresh tokens, so that's the minimum thing you could have on a user model at any way, in any sort of way. Abstract user gives you everything on a normal user, a Django user model, except for the permissions. Django's own user is actually just abstract user plus a permissions mix in and nothing else. Technically, you can use any model. It doesn't have to use abstract user or abstract base user. However, the further you get away from the path, all bets start to come off. Model backend probably won't work. Built-in forms definitely won't work. Um, Django also requires you provide a definition for a, a field called username field, which is a string holding the name of the field that contains the unique identifier, and required fields, a list of names of fields that are non-optional on your model. 
You also have to define a get full name and get short name method. This is a, a feint towards doing it properly. We've now embedded in Django better practice as the contract for users going forward, and that is only really used by the admin site so that it can say hello X at the top of the website. Second step, you need to define a manager. The manager, you describe how to create users and how to create super users. And that is essentially just there so that your website can instantiate a new user and instantiate a new super user, either from the command line manage, manage.py create super user interface or through the admin itself, if there are other processes around the outside that you've got to allocate tokens or something like that. Uh, you then need to define forms to edit your user. A user creation form and a user change form need to be defined for anything other than an abstract user. Why do you need to define your forms? Why can't Django just magic form for you? Well, your user model could contain anything. Your username field could be named anything. It contains anything. Validation rules could be anything. So we as the Django core team were faced with a choice of either writing a completely generic form that will try to adapt to anything, um, or we could say, provide your own. Guess what we did? User admin, we can then register our user model with the admin. User admin uh, provided by Django is quite a detailed class. It defines field sets and points for default forms. You can either take that user admin and then override to set appropriate values or define your own admin, so admin uh, class from default. Register your user site with admin and you don't actually need to unregister anything. It will act as long as, as soon as you've introduced a second user model, Django's default user model will not be registered by the admin. Step five, we need to register the model with Django itself. And this is really where the magic happens. There's one setting in your settings.py file, auth user model equals myapp.myuser, just a dotted path pointing at the application name and model name of the model that you wish to use as your identifier, as your identifying model. Then, in your code, you need to change any direct references to the user model. So if you were, if you were previously saying, uh, owner, like a foreign, I've got a model here with a foreign key to user, which was directly imported from auth.models, we replace that by saying we're going to reference settings.authusermodel. Okay, so we import the setting that is the name of the user model and we reference that instead. Um, what does this do? Well, it changes all your foreign keys to point at the user model that is defined as part of your settings. And that's it. You've basically got a custom user model. And if you do want to do a query on that custom user model, you don't just import it and call user. You can go to uh, contrib.auth, call get user model, and then use that to evaluate what your user model is, and then call queries on that. So that last user down the bottom isn't necessarily Django's user or your user. It is the user that has been returned as a class from the previous call to get user model. All right. So. It is relatively simple, relatively straightforward for most applications, particularly if you're using a pluggable third-party app for your user model. It is basically import the app and, and set uh, auth user model to whatever it needs to be. But there are a couple of things you might get caught on. If you're writing a reusable application, you need to be wary of reverse lookup naming. The name of your user model, the name of any model in Django, is used to control reverse lookups. So if you're writing generic code, like you would be if you're writing a third-party app or a, a pluggable app, uh, you need to be aware of this. So let's say we've got ourselves a Django model and we're using a user model here, which extends abstract user. Um, we can get an instance of a department and then do a reverse foreign key lookup on the name of the model that we're related through. And that name gets the automatically generated name of user set. Fantastic. We take that same code and we change the name of our user model. We've got a problem. The reverse name is now my user set, okay? which is a problem if you want your code to be reusable. So how do you fix this? Well, you can always call your user model user. It works, but it's not exactly robust. Other option, uh, always make sure you set a related name. Okay, so that forces the related name to always be user set, regardless of what the class is actually called. Or you can factor in the dynamic aspect of that naming. Most projects don't have this problem. It only affects foreign keys and many-to-many -many fields that are defined on the user model itself but there's at least one common field that, occur, that is defined this way, groups. Django defines a related name, so it's always groups.user set, but it didn't in Django 1.5. That, that got introduced in Django 1.6, so there's one little backwards incompatibility there. Second thing you need to watch out, and something that has become an issue since user models were originally introduced, is migrations. Auth user model is a setting, and in principle, you can change that setting. But if you do, you are effectively changing every foreign key reference to the old model, to the new model, and you're doing it in a way that can't be tracked because settings aren't tracked by the migrations framework. So 
the general rule of thumb here, set your user model once at the start of your project before you run your first migration. Then don't change it, ever. Don't even think about it. Not even a little bit, not even at all. Skypony is watching you. <laughs> now, that might seem like a pretty big restriction. It isn't necessarily, though, as bad as it seems. There are ways of doing the migration if it has to be done. Marcus gave a talk last year at DjangoCon Europe uh, where he does step through the process. It's complicated. It's nasty. You don't want to do it. Just do it this way to start with. Um, the catch is the issue isn't migrating the model itself, the user model itself. Any given user model can be very easily migrated. Change the username field, make it longer, add an email address. Django's, Django has made several migrations to its own user model since migrations were added. That is not the problem. The issue is changing every foreign key reference to that model and all the foreign key constraints to that model and so on. Now, if your project's going to be long-lived, by which I mean this is a website that's going to last more than a couple of months, always use a custom user model, even if it's just a copy of Django's own model, because then you have the flexibility to put whatever you want on your user model. The other thing you need to watch out for as a developer of use reusable applications is the user contract. Django has always had a user contract. It just wasn't explicit because it didn't need to be. There was only one user model. Now we have to be clear. Does your code assume that all users have a username? or an email address, or a date of birth. If you're re, uh, building reusable apps, you need to be very clear about exactly what your user contract is, what fields you expect there to be. The abstract user defines a bare minimal user contract. There is a unique identifier, and you can get a text identifier of a short name and one for a full name. That's it. If you need more, you need to define that as part of your, your definition of what a user is for your application. Now, as I said earlier, one of the driving forces behind custom user models was the desire to have custom profile data. What's profile data? Well, potentially, it's any user-specific information that you might want to track about the user itself uh, or themselves. There's really sort of three options here. Option one, you put everything on the user model. Don't have a profile at all. Just put extra fields. You want a new field, stick it on the user model. Off it goes. Option two, keep the user model bare minimum. Put everything else onto a profile model that is linked one-to-one -one with the user. Now, why would you go through that particular piece of contortion? Well, it's really about separation of concerns. It's a little bit easier if you take this to extremes, or easy to see why if you take it to extremes. If we split up our profiles again, each pluggable application can then introduce its own profile model that contains the bits about the profile that it cares about. So we might have an application dealing with birth records that, I, that uses the identity profile. And then the Display Tools app has the display profile. Each individual app can have its own profile requirements instead of them all kind of crowding in on the one basic user model. In some regard, this is kind of just an extreme form of interfaces. You're defining sub-interfaces that are part of your user contract, and you're using joins to enforce that conceptual separation. The third option, of course, is a hybrid, to keep the core stuff on the user model and put the rest onto a profile. So should you be using single user models or profiles or some sort of hybrid between the two? Uh, well, it depends. Broadly speaking, profiles are better architecture. They physically separate authorization and display concerns from authentication. But there's a cost. The downside of using profiles is that every time you request the user object, you need to get one or more profiles as well. Now, this can be optimized out if you have select related, but it's still a join, and depending upon your database, that might be expensive and so on. And the complaint then comes, but if I have a separate profile object, my site won't be able to scale to the size of Instagram. Yeah, yes, correct, but let's file that under problems we'd like to have. 99% uh, of websites aren't in the top 1% of websites on the planet. Engineering time is much more valuable than CPU time generally, and the benefits of being able to use reusable apps vastly outweigh the cost of a little bit of extra database load for almost every application for most people in this room. So the real solution is going to be a hybrid, but the question is where to draw the line. A rule of thumb, think about what is truly core about your user experience on your website. What is essential to identify a user? And what's interesting facts about a user? Name, probably critical identity. Avatar, might be under the right circumstances. Birthday, definitely start to get edge case. Favorite books, almost certainly a profile site unless you're dealing with a library maybe. Ultimately, it's up to you to make those design decisions for your specific site. Now, there are two other pleasant side effects of separating out profiles from user. Firstly, the need to migrate your user model is greatly reduced. Pick a user model that maps to your authentication scheme, login by email, login by username, whatever, and then put all your other data into a profile. 
The significance of the user model then is essentially at the core of your app is greatly reduced. Unless you're planning to change the way people log into your website, you won't need to change your user model. And it is even possible to do your authentication via the profile if you want, you know, we're going to add Facebook logins and Twitter logins and all the rest. It also means that using a third party application for your user model then becomes a lot, makes a lot more sense. There are a bunch of libraries out there that provide email based login, other common login schemes. If you aren't dependent upon putting profile data in your user model, then you can pick whatever login mechanism you want, include a third party app, make all subsequent changes to your profile model. The other thing profiles do is solve the problem of having multiple types of user. A moderately common question on Django users is, it goes something like this. I have a learning management system for a university. How do, I, uh, how do I have two types of user model, one for teachers and one for students? The answer, you don't. What you do is treat the user model as the source of authentication. Who are you? But you defer authorization, what can you do, to the profile. And then any individual user can then have two separate profiles, one for teachers and one for students. When someone logs in, they provide a username and password or whatever the user model happens to require. But when you go to check permissions, you look for user.student.property or user.teacher.property, which then also allows the edge case where a student is also a teacher. Now, I might be studying business, but teaching computer science. This approach lets me do both with the same user account, but two different profiles depending upon where I am in the website. So lastly, I'm going to lift the lid just a little bit, show you how this feature works. The caveat, what I'm about to describe is not official API. It's an internal. The reason it's not, not official is that there's general disagreement in the core team about whether it's a good idea for general consumption. I'm showing this to you today because I think it's worth formalizing. And the first steps to formalizing it is to have people experiment with it and see how fragile it actually is in practice. So treat it a bit like Meta used to be before Django 1.9, no, 1.10. Um, it's not documented. Officially, it's unstable API. Use it if it helps. Um, internally, there are no internal references to auth.user. Auth.user has a property on its Meta class called swappable. And it says swappable equals auth user model. That defines the name of the setting that describes how you can swap out the user model. Okay, it is inspected when the, when, when the Django stack starts up, that is inspected at the time the application is loaded, generates a meta.swapped if there is a replacement. If your settings file defines auth user model, it goes and defines meta.swapped on the user model. So then the user model is being marked as, no, I've been swapped out for this other thing. So the rest of Django can then deal with that. And the rest is just validation. Are you referring to a class that has been swapped out? There are no new features on foreign keys and many to many's. Foreign key to a string auth.user has always worked. An auth user model is just a string. All we're doing now is using a setting to define that string. And there is some validation to make sure that a foreign key doesn't point to a swapped out model. The dirty secret, and at this point I expect to see Andrew and Marcus running up here to throttle me with the microphone cord. Um, because there's nothing user specific about the whole process, you can define your own swappable models. <laughs> How? All you need to do is add swappable equals name of setting to the model that you want to, want to be swappable. And as an end user, define data model, in this case, you know, swappable equals data model, data model equals name of model in your settings.py file. Django will manage the rest, subject to all the caveats that apply to users and migrations and all the things that we've seen in the user, with user space. What might you want to do this for? Well, if you've got an application domain where there really is just one content type and everything refers to it, but the actual content of the content might need to vary. You might have a use case here for swappable models. Think about comments on an article. Comments all have the same data model. Article doesn't necessarily, or can, is something that can change as long as you're pointing to one of them. Anywhere where you might have previously used a generic foreign key, but there's only ever one thing you're going to need to point at. You just don't know wh uh, what, the, where the, what the users, end users class is going to be called. That's where you can use this. Now, like I said, this bit's unofficial. The good angels, Andrew and Marcus, will curse your firstborn if you ever use it. Um, the evil angel, Russell, says, do it, do it. And now these slides will self-destruct. So you have been warned. And that's it. The hard part of Django user models turns out that it isn't the Django part. It's the user part. Turns out people are complicated. But the time you spend thinking about these problems is time well spent, because it's at the core of how your users relate to your website. 
I'm going to be around to the end of the sprints. I'll mostly be working on Beware rather than Django, which I'll be talking about tomorrow and possibly Sunday as well. Um, there are some Django-related tasks, though, as part of Beware, if you are interested. Uh, thanks to Revolution Systems, I've got a stash of contributor coins. Uh, so if you're owed one or you want to earn one for contributing to Beware, come along and grab me. Um, thanks to GitHub, I also have Yakurta coins for people who want to help other people get involved with Beware. And uh, that's all for now, so thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, it was really entertaining seeing Marcus on one side giving a double thumbs up and Andrew on the other face palming so hard. <laughs> but you get a cup and a thing. Thank you so, very much. Yes. Clap, 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 clap. Yeah.